Hello there. My name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. When it comes to successful angling politics and actually getting things done, English anglers could perhaps learn much from the Scottish counterparts. Or should that be how the English and Scots are working together to take battles being fought north of the border to the Scottish Assembly and European Parliament? For although the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, also known by the acronym SASAKAN, are very effectively spearheading that campaign, two-thirds of the credit for getting SASAKAN into the ring in the first place goes to English anglers Ian Burrett and Steve Basterman, with Dennis Kelly making up the Scottish input to the founding trio. When I first started sea fishing back in the 1970s, no one could ever have envisaged the need for conservation politics with regards to Scotland. It was the angling haven to which hundreds of local as well as visiting anglers journeyed every weekend. But sadly, apart from a few isolated big fish hotspots, it most certainly isn't like that now in 2010. With me here is Loose Bay Charter Skipper Ian Burrett, one of Sacken's co-founders and current projects director for the organisation. So, from such an illustrious standing on the sea angling scene back at the start of the 1970s, how has, and where did, things start to go so badly wrong for Scotland? Yeah, sea angling got very big in the 1960s. It was the first time there was really any organised fishing. Clubs sprung up from all over. There was uh, tourists coming up from, from England to go fishing, mainly in the, the Clyde, areas around the Gantocks, so producing 20, 30 pound cod with a norm. And sadly, they, they stopped the three mile limit in uh, 1969 and allowed the, the boats to move back into the Clyde, where they'd actually been banned since before the turn of the previous century. So that was the 1900s that were barred from the Clyde. And within, within two years, the angling festivals, which had over 1,300 participants, were stopped because of lack of fish. The huge loss in revenue to local tradesmen, local tackle shops, worm diggers, charter boats... Sasakan actually did some research, Sasakan, sorry, been the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, actually did some research on the number of charter boats that were in the Clyde, and at one stage there were 110 charter boats, and there's now one. Now that certainly gives a, an indication of, of the, the loss of the fish stocks around the Clyde, but sadly it isn't just the Clyde that's seen a huge uh, depreciation in the number of fish stocks. The, the whole of the West Coast is really in trouble now, the IUCN actually has cod, haddock and whiting as the lowest observed levels. And despite attempts to try and put cod bands on, nothing is recovering. My own personal feeling, and, and I can only say that it is my own personal feeling, is that uh, it can never recover until they stop the destructive scallop dredges and the prawn dredges of the Clyde, which actually produce 40 million discards. A lot of these fish are actually little tiny, tiny pin weighting, small codling. But just think what a difference it would make if just half of these were allowed to develop and become mature adults. What a difference that would make in such a short time. There's many people believe now that we are actually at rock bottom and that if something isn't done immediately, it will be too late. And for some species, it might even be too late already. Particularly the, the sharks, which are very, very late in maturing only give birth to a few live young. So for, for species like that, they could perhaps take 20, 30 or even 50 years to recover, if they're allowed to. I believe as a first early response in trying to halt the decline and take on some sort of leadership role, the Scottish Federation of Sea Anglers was formed. But by all accounts, they seem to have contributed little, if anything, to fighting and reversing this decline at the political level. Yeah, the Scottish Federation of Sea Anglers were, were formed and at first they did a very good job in United Angling within Scotland, but it became very much competition focused, and the people who were driving it were the internationals, the club people, and as the fish stocks dropped, so did the number of people entering competitions, so the actual role of the SFSA has declined significantly in the, in the last few years. In real terms, it's not thought upon very wisely by anyone except those doing competitions. Did they ever make any sort of genuine attempt at tackling political issues at all? It was never involved in, in conservation or attempts to improve fish stocks. It was merely a competition organiser. And uh, sadly, it, when we approached the Scottish Federation to try and uh, help and do something about it, there was so much negativity within the organisation 
that it was actually, we, we decided it would be easier to form a new organisation rather than try and get involved with the SFSA. What then made you and your Sasak and co-founder members think that your approach could make any more of a success of things than what is, after all, Scotland's official national sea angling representation body? And how did you actually set about establishing the credentials of SAC and to take that particular fight forward? To start at the very beginning, when I started charter fishing in Loose Bay, there were shoals of spur dog five miles across. This was in 1990 to about 1992. And to be honest, at that time we considered total pest value. The next four years saw the French, the Belgians, the Kubri longliners, boats from all across Europe fishing for the spur dog. And we saw the shoals decimated totally in four years. To such a degree, we went ten years without actually catching one. In 2004-2005, a lower stock businessman tried to get all the commercials to start targeting the taupe. Now, a few of us got together on, on, on the, an internet forum and thought, we just can't allow to happen to the taupe what happened to the spur dog. So we founded a group called Save Our Sharks which did very, very well to raise the awareness of, of, of the shark problems. But when we approached the government, government weren't an, even prepared to listen to sea anglers. And it was understood at a very early age that we had to raise a profile of sea angling if we'd got any chance for a sea angling body to make a difference. So there was uh, the chairman of, of Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, Steve Basterman. He was pushing at the, the Scottish Federation, trying to get them involved in conservation. There was a group called the Sea Anglers Conservation Network, which was an English group, and uh, I started off forming the Scottish Sea Anglers Conservation Network. And it, it soon became apparent that the, the three organisations trying to make a difference in Scotland were duplicating on a lot of work. So we formed the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network, and basically it started off as three people. That was myself, Steve Bassman, who was chairman, and Dennis Kelly, who was secretary. And one of the first things we organised was an event in Holyrood. We uh, had a presentation and we got a, a room booked in Holyrood and invited the members of Scottish Parliament along. We had um, a question and answer panel, very similar to the question time on television. And a lot of the, the politicians were made to sit up and take note because everything that had ever been produced by Scottish Scottish government kept saying how healthy the stocks were, when in reality, people know better. You know, people know the stocks are diminished. So we had the Holyrood event, we had email campaigns, which uh, aimed at all MSPs to try and get them on board. The Conservatives were, were very supportive, the Labour were very supportive, and even some of the SMPs were supportive, even though they're in government, and they were speaking out against against the government policy. So we, we, we pushed and pushed, um, hundreds of emails sent out, etc. And eventually we got an invite to meet Mr Lockhead. We'd been asking to meet with the fisheries minister for two or three years and we turned down. And eventually we got the meeting with Mr Lockhead. Out of this meeting we managed to get a, a study done on the, the economic value of sea angling in Scotland. And this has proved very, very significant because politicians will only listen to the facts and although we put it around £150 million for Scotland, this includes the hotels, tackle trade, etc. Although we thought it was around £150 million, it wasn't until the economic study came out that confirmed that amount figure. In fact, the economic study put the minimum defendable is £142 million, but anything up to £200 million. In this present climate, if they could do more to increase the fish stocks, there's no doubt in anyone's mind who would also increase, increase the value of sea angling. And the Clyde, which was mentioned earlier, used to attract anglers from all over Europe. It was a, it, it even held the European Championships three times. So there's a straight correlation between fish stocks and the number of anglers, i.e. the amount of money they're prepared to spend in Scotland. So once the economic study had, had been done, Certainly windows opened and people at Visit Scotland started taking an interest and we're at a stage now where we are sat with the government developing strategy for the development of sea angling and within about two months we will be putting a proposal through to the fisheries minister, Mr Lockhead. He will look at these proposals, I yay or nay them, but we're working with people from the coastal forums, from Visit Scotland, Sports Scotland, Marine Scotland, 
officers from the old uh, FRS, which was a fisheries research scientists. So there's a lot of people involved developing this strategy. And one of the, the biggest and overriding theme running through the strategy is to produce more and bigger fish. Without the more and bigger fish, sea angling will slowly die. If something isn't done, the income into Scotland will drop accordingly. And it supports many, many jobs. In fact, the survey showed it, it points up 1,900 people are employed through sea angling in Scotland. So it's not just income to, to the tackle trades, it's actual jobs we're talking about here. You said earlier that at the onset, so far as seemingly ill-informed Scottish parliamentarians were concerned, Scotland's inshore fish stocks were in a healthy state. Presumably then, that's what the salaried fishery scientists were telling them, though in fairness I suppose it could also have been a case of them putting their own skewed interpretation on the data. So how does Sasakin gather in its science-based data and make it more credible than theirs? This is actually one of the main problems we have in that when we were made aware that the likes of Loch Sunnet and Loch Etive may contain a resident population of spur dog and certainly is a nursery area, we were told that the government couldn't do anything without the data. So one of the things we, we looked at was getting the Scottish shark tagging program underway. We now, in, in the last year, we have doubled the number of, of people tagging. Because we're, we're tagging, it's, it, it's not just about sticking a tag in the fish, but whilst people are tagging, they're thinking about the fish husbandry. They're putting the, the, the care of the fish is crucial. They abide by the, the fish handling guides that we've, we've written. So it is not just the data gathered, it's the fact people are looking after the fish they catch. Some of these fish are critically endangered. The likes of the common skate would not even be accepted as being still around Scotland if it hasn't been for the work of anglers actually promoting the areas where they can be found. We hope through the marine parks to actually get the areas for the common skate, the uh, spur dog, protected. OK, so Sasaka members and helpers are now currently tagging those fish species you feel are in need of more detailed study. But isn't it the case that sticking dart tags into fish is as much a cosmetic as it is a practical data gathering exercise? To get more meaningful data at the speed that is required in light of the danger some of these fish species face, surely it would make more sense to use other types of tracking, such as satellite tags. Yes, they are more expensive, but on a cost outlay to data recovery ratio, this has to be the way forward. Surely, making your point and making it quickly is paramount at this particular moment in time. That's actually a very good question, because when, when Sasakin started, with no history, Achieving fundraising was very, very difficult. But we're now at a stage where we've had two or three major grants through and we've delivered what we promised. But once you've got a track record, it becomes far easier in attracting funding. So we actually now employ a sharp project officer who's supported by the Scottish National Heritage and leader, which is European money. So through the government, indirectly, the government are actually paying for the shark tagging programme. Now, regards the more sophisticated tags you're talking about, we very, very recently inserted some what's called pinger tags in Loch Etiv. On the entrance of Loch Etiv, it had been a very, very narrow across the, by the bridge, we placed some acoustic listening devices. The tags go inside the spur dog, and if they pass within 400 yards of the listening device, then it will register so we will know within a 12 month period exactly what sharks are moving in and out, which is, will be a, certainly a much quicker way than the, the, the Floyd dart tags, which really is a long term project. But it is able to tell us things like growth rates and stock movements and stock fluctuations, which you can't always get through the likes of satellite tagging. There's also a scheme afoot to get some more funding, which we were quite hopeful about, to be able to do some satellite tagging on the tow. And we've recently placed 11 data storage tags in Spurdog and have another six to, to go in this weekend at a special tagging event we're having. So we are looking at the more sophisticated methods to get answers quicker. While they obviously have the place in adding some detail to the wider picture, pinger tags unfortunately can only tell you one thing. If all the fish tagged in this way decide to stay inside the lock, that tells you nothing other than the fact that they are resident. Without more versatile data storage tags, Localised migration patterns, breeding groupings, diurnal or nocturnal movements and all the rest will remain unknown. And the answers to some of those questions can only come from more sophisticated and by the very nature, more expensive tagging approaches. 
So how does Sasakin aim to produce these missing data sets? You know, the data storage tags, they rely on the fish being captured. Once the fish is captured, the tag that's attached is put into a computer and it gives readouts on the depths and ranges it goes to movement. It doesn't contain GPS, but they're able to work out through water temperatures, through levels of rising up through the water, etc., more about the movements. So the, the satellite one is the ultimate one, and that's what we're working towards. It would be superb to have satellite tags on the spur dog, the tope, the common skate. Has any thought been given to fin clipping for DNA analysis in, say, Locative? That might provide a quicker, easier, and possibly even cheaper answer to questions regarding residency, and possibly even a drift towards subspeciation through isolation, because Locative spurs most certainly look different to the relatives taken outside the lock. That is an area we, we are looking into, although it is very, very expensive, the DNA testing. But uh, there's also methods of, of taking the membrane. They have, they have, a lot of fish like the common skate have like a protective membrane on them, and you can take a scraping of the, the membrane and get that analysed. So we, we are looking at those sort of things. We've only, we've only just recently been in a position to, to even think about acquiring the funding for these things. But we, we, we believe that as, as we are now doing it for the government, in that... The Community Plan of Action, which is a European ruling, states that member states must gather evidence on the, the, the sharks, on the, the, the amount of different species, the dynamics, the fluctuations, etc., the health of the sharks. So we're hoping that the government will pay for more and more. We, we're quite happily supplying the volunteer anglers, but uh, it'd be nice to think they're going to be paying for it, as they're the ones eventually will will benefit from it, because we will, in three years' time, be in a situation to produce management plans. We have data on from Glasgow Museum tagging programme going back 35 years. We need to analyse that. We've got tagging data on tope, which goes back 20 years. We need to analyse that. And we've recently got some old data from the government scientists from the 1960s when they did a lot of tagging on Spurdog. Now, we've we've been working away and, and getting that into electronic form because it was all on, on paper. And that also needs analysing. So in the next three years we will be in a far better situation to be able to start analysing this and come up with some results and produce management plans. Could it not then be argued that discrete populations, particularly if they turn out to be genetically isolated, are at greater risk than the rest? That being the case, would it not make more sense to discover where these isolated populations are and seek out more additional specific protection for them? Yeah, those sort of things you're looking at couldn't be done because the legislation wasn't in place to be able to pass such laws. But the Marine Bill has enabled this legislation. And we're hoping that the way forwards for, for Sasakan and for Sea Angles in general is through marine protected areas. There's a special one called the Science Research Demonstration MPA. And this is for small groups, individuals or locals or organisations to be able to propose a marine protected area for a specific reason. And recently we, we wrote a paper and have taken it around the MSPs called Angling Regeneration Centres or ARCs. This was our idea to have angling only centres similar to the, the have in Florida Keys, which destructs destructive forms of commercial fishing. The marine protector, it already looks as if there's a strong movement towards there being one in the Firth of Lawn. At the strategy meeting, a lot of the focus is actually on the southwest of Scotland, Loose Bay and the Solway, for another protected area. Because it's an area where there's still a lot of fish, although the numbers and species have diminished alarmingly in recent years. There's a lot of fish, a lot of income derived, and the potential to earn a lot more income for the region. So we would like to see certainly Loose Bay, Solway, and perhaps Firth alone, Sunnet, as protected areas, and it will protect the, the bottom so that if there is a re revival on the likes of white species, the round fish, then at least the bottom, the habitat, will be in place. A key word which repeatedly gets mentioned throughout this interview is Sasakan. For those who don't already know, this is a purely Scottish organisation, though its successes can and already have had implications for angling throughout the whole of Europe. So tell us then a little bit more about what Sasakan is looking to achieve in terms of future change. Yeah, Sasakan, the full title, is the Scottish Sea Angling Conservation Network. The way we see ourselves is that we represent the fish as much as, as the anglers. We, we're, we, we want to produce more and bigger fish because the actual conservation on a species happens to fit nicely with what anglers want, and that is more and bigger fish. So Sakin now has a membership of over a 1,000 people, which in three years is, is, is a good growth. 
200 people are involved in the tagging, but we're also involved at grass level routes on, uh, we have an educational outreach program now where our shark project officer goes around the, the primary schools. He does a two or three hour uh, lecture on, on sharks, the biology, etc. And then they go on, go on to the beaches and look for purses. The, the mermaid's purses are the, the eggs that some sharks lay, like common skate. They don't, they don't give birth to live young. They actually lay a, a purse, which is almost a square shape, and the fish develop inside it. So these are anchored or tethered to the bottom through loops of strands that hang off them, and they curl around the seaweed. Sasakan so is definitely growing outside, just a little organisation desperately trying to save the toad. So Sasakan now has is a, a registered charity. It uh, has a management team of six or seven people. And we are an internet-based organisation. A, a lot of the things is sent out through email. We are fortunate enough with, with Sasakan to, to get a graphic designer on board who has certainly raised the quality of the work we put out. He's a professional, that's what he does. So the, the, the actual literature we put out now is very, very good. Sasakan has written codes of practice, fish handling guides, etc. And these have been accepted right across Europe now and in fact been downloaded into, I think it's 17 different languages. Sasakin is now also an employer, something I bet you never envisaged back in those early days of banging your heads on Parliament's doors. So tell us a little bit more about that aspect of Sasakin's expansion and how monies from grants, donations and fundraising come in, and more importantly, how they are spent. One lot of funding was from Scottish National Heritage and Leader, which is for the Sharp Project Officer that we employ, and for the day-to-day -day running of the Sharp Tagging Programme and the, the publicity and advancement of it. We attend trade shows. We've got some fabulous uh, stand-up displays, which we can we take everywhere we go with us. We get them put in places like the Sea Life Centres, the aquariums, so to try and get the Sasakan name across. And in respective of whatever political persuasion you or your members might have, Sasakan has a political dimension in that it wants to see the enactment of legislation that will seriously curtail the activities of other individuals and groups within Scotland and, ultimately, the rest of the UK and even Europe. How does Sasakan representatives steer what must be a very difficult course through the delicate issue of party politics? And where have these talks taken you up to date? We had to get involved with the politics side because no one wanted to listen to us. They were supported by people like the Tories, the MSPs, and I would think probably about six times a year, Sasakin gets a special mention in Parliament as a, as a like a thank you. We recently won an, an award called the Dream Store Award, which is a nice big fancy crystal trophy, and three MSPs actually emailed our chairman to ask if they could bring it up in Parliament and mention it in a, a motion in Parliament, congratulating us on our successes. And we're seen now by many MSPs to be a crucial part in, in, in helping regenerate the fish stocks. I was asked personally last year to go and speak in, in Parliament at the, at the parliamentary debate on the state of Scotland's seas, because some of the Scottish scientists are still giving out that the seas are healthy. So I, I gave, I was asked to give this opinion, and to be honest, <laughs> I felt a little bit out of my depth. The, uh, there was myself sat alongside lawyers who have been studying fish legislation and management for years and years, and I was I was on my own as, as a charter skipper, thinking, oh, I'm way out my depth. But one of the MSPs, one of the friendly ones, asked me a direct question about what was the second's thoughts on the sea state, and then I was allowed to go ahead and, and give my thoughts, and uh, I think it went down well or well appreciated to hear a different side to to the the situation. So the, the politicians now, there's, we've probably got seven or eight who we can call on at any stage to raise matters in Parliament, and it was seen by politicians as, as very important to the survival of Scottish fish stocks. You mention Parliament, and by that I take it you mean the Scottish Parliament, but your influence has gone far wider than that to Westminster and even to Brussels. Yeah, we as as members of SOS, we actually went into to uh, Brussels three times and met up with MEPs. We were also responsible for overturning Article, what was Article Forty Seven, which was a, a series of control regulations that were brought in to bring sea angling into the Common Fisheries Policy. When it was first published, it had the ability to destroy sea angling in its tracks. There was just no leeway, and at, at one stage. 
we were talking to MEP, an MEP who was actually giving alternative proposals in the Parliament. So it was, it was, I was on the phone to him with the mobile and he was saying, can you accept this? Can you accept that? So we, we had a great bearing on, on Article 47, which later became Article 55. And this Article 55 now was downwatered so much that it may well affect cod fishermen. As it looks at the moment, they are going to be doing some form of taking assessment of this, the cod that sea anglers catch. And if it is deemed significant, and the, the pitfall here is no one can tell us what significant means, they, if, it, if we are found to be significant, then there may well be bag limits come on cod fishermen. But our argument is, as a conservation group, if, and I say if, the anglers are taking a significant part of the stocks, then perhaps there should be bag limits. If it's needed to help regenerate the stocks, then as an organisation, we will be all for it, providing the science is there. Not on a whim, not on, on someone's understanding within Europe, but actually if the science is there, then we could support bag limits. One point I feel I should bring out into the open here is that although to get things done you have had to become a political lobby group, collectively you are not party political. Regardless of who was in power, presumably the objectives would remain the same. Yeah, absolutely. We've, we've no political bias at all. Our, our arguments first started when Labour had a coalition with, with the Liberals, and actually Ross Finney was the, the fisheries minister then. Um, <laughs> to show you how far we have come, when the first letter I wrote to, to Ross Finney, I waited about 12 weeks for an answer and was told that our problems weren't with the Marine Directorate, as we were called then. We ought to go, go see Visit Scotland. And I politely remind him that how could Visit Scotland put more fish in the sea? So, no, with no, with no political bias. We do believe Richard Lockhead is a sincere guy, and we really hope he, we can deliver through, through Richard Lockhead. Sadly, there's another election coming up in May. It, this could all change. We could end up dealing with a different fisheries minister who has a totally different view. So there's nothing, nothing's in science. There's nothing written that says sea angling is going to be improved in Scotland. But I do believe the tide has turned. I do believe we've made enough noise. I do believe there's enough organisations backing us. We now have people like WWF, uh, the Marine Conservation Society, writing to us, asking us to support them on some of their missions because we seem to be that important within Scotland. And it's accepted. We make more noise than, than any of the really big organisations. And that's because we're, we're keen and we care. Taking a short step back for a moment, earlier you mentioned Article 47 and its watered-down offspring, Article 55. Can you fill in a little bit more detail as to what these are and how they might affect anglers as a group or even individuals? Yeah, if it hadn't been watered down, they were going to check the stock levels or the amount of fish that anglers took on all species whereas it eventually it ended up on species in a recovery programme. Well, the only two species in a recovery programme in the UK is cod and the sole, which is the sole is not really considered an angling product, although the odd ones are caught. So that was one of the first things. It didn't make it clear whether it concerned shore anglers or boat anglers, so it could actually have included all anglers, not, not just boat anglers, whereas the, the new Article 55 is just solely for boat anglers. And it talked about closures, etc., rather than, or implied closures rather than bag limits. So it really did get moved a long way. Each, each week there'd be a new climb down from the MEPs, from the, the, the record uh, leading uh, European fisheries. Mr. Borg, who was backed into a corner virtually week by week and, and had to pedal backwards. So I didn't actually mean this, what I did mean. So a lot of it was, was so vague the way it was written, and that's why it had the ability to destroy, because it could have been interpreted to do anything. It was all tightened up with when it became Article 55. I'm not sure what's going to come out of it. We, we're to second a meeting with the, the control regulation people very, very soon, and we'll have more an idea of how they're actually going to count the stocks. We're not sure whether it's going to be through charter boats or whether they're going to be asking people to fill in cards as, as they come in from the fishing. But uh, one of the things it talked about, the, the first, when it was Article 47, it implied that licenses would be needed for fishermen. And we got this overturned as well, because we're not ready for licenses. I, I do believe that sea anglers would happily pay a license if the money was used to benefit sea angling. If it was ring-fenced to develop more and bigger fish, to put on better slipways, Im improve amenities. 
So it was felt that when this was mentioned, it was going to be just another form of taxation. There was a strong feeling against it. And fortunately in Scotland, there's no thoughts from the government to actually put any licences or anything in place. Clearly, as the Sacken's profile has become raised, you've got yourself into more and more meetings. Back in the early days, that would have meant you knocking on politicians' doors requesting a hearing. But now I understand it's the other way around, with invites coming in from here, there and everywhere. What was the pivotal moment which made the seesaw tip in Sir Sacken's favour? The big turning point was the getting the, the economic study. The event in Holyrood was obviously very, very crucial. Our chairman will attend between 50 and 70 meetings a year, with council forums, with politicians, with the Crown Estates, with Scottish National Heritage, the fisheries scientists. So it's an ongoing thing, attending meetings, and as you quietly, quietly said, rather than us asking, can we come to these meetings, we are now being asked to attend all these meetings. As the, the, the name just advances, and the things are included in advances. It, it, it really is remarkable just how we've raised our profile in such a short time. And things are starting to happen. The, the science research M MPAs could actually have been written for Sasakan because they fit exactly into the, they fit the criteria exactly that we need to get areas closed for angling only and non-destructive commercial fishing. Meetings are all very well, but the crux of all such meetings is evidence in the form of indisputable data. We've already touched on various forms of tagging and DNA analysis. Given the funding, what other sources of data might also prove helpful in the future? The conclusion to all the work we want to do is to, to, to work with government scientists to produce management plans, which will be the benefit of the stocks and, and the habitats. Unless we're directly involved with the management plans, then we really don't see there's, there's much hope for the stocks. Arguably, the biggest practical public involvement to Sir Sacken's work has come from staging your angling tagathons, usually with a single species bias, but at the same time willing and able to tag other cartilaginous species if and when caught. This all started with the spur dogs at Loch Sunnet and Etid, then later with the taupe and other shark species in and around Loose Bay. Next up, I believe, it's the turn of the common skate at the venue we're at today, which is Crinan. As good as tagathons are in raising public awareness and profile, are these mainly cosmetic, or do they actually generate good, hard, meaningful data useful to take the cause forward? As, as I mentioned earlier about um, the government insisting on data, we started the tagging programmes to increase that data, to, and we decided to have our first tagging event in Loch Sunnet and Loch, Loch Etive. I think we had between 50 and 60 anglers there, and we tagged a number of fish that weekend, probably about 100 fish. As a result of the success of that, and the fact that the guys involved really enjoyed it, it was felt we ought to hold one down in Loose Bay, and, and the Solway, uh, for the tote. So, the first shark attack was organised, and the, the BBC really took us on board. I mean, they did us absolutely proud. We were on breakfast TV, live on the hour broadcasts, right through the day, there were radio broadcasts, they were actually on the boat, giving live feeds back to the, to London. Uh, we were on BBC, the commercial service. So they actually reckoned we reached about a hundred million people that day. And as much of these special tagging events is about raising the public awareness. The most common thing said after the first shark attack was people didn't actually know the species of sharks in Scotland. People have visions of jaws and on the Great Barrier Reef with bull sharks and things, but no one actually realised what sharks are in Scotland. So raising the awareness and keeping the pressure on the politicians was seen crucial alongside the tagging events because it's not just about putting a few tags in fish. Unless people are aware of the need for protection, then we weren't going to get anywhere. So the, the, the special tagging events now have proved absolutely phenomenally successful. The, the shark attack the last weekend in June actually put £50,000 into the local economy through anglers coming up literally from Caithness right down to Cornwall. We had over 200 anglers at that event, raised £50,000 in a weekend for the area. So it shows what can happen if there was an organisation like Visit Scotland who wanted to restore angling festivals and things. Yeah, we're talking big money. And the, the tagging events, again, because of the success of it, we've decided now to run the third one for the, for the skate in Crinan, because Crinan is a, a special area of all sizes of, of common skate, from small ones, the smallest we've seen is about six pound, the small males, small females, and big females and big males. So it's another area where we, we hope to gather the data, 
show by the, the tag returns just how important the area is to the, the regeneration of the common skate. So the, the special events are, are, have got many different reasons for happening, but they are success and, and the anglers enjoy them. It's all about having fun as well. And it makes government take note again. The result of the last shark attack, Mr Lockhead actually came out on, on the charter boat round South West Scotland. He fished for Pollock. He experienced Pollock himself. And his remark he made was, do you mean to say people pay you and then and then put the fish back? Doesn't matter how many emails it had on catch and release, how important that can be, he still hadn't got the true concept of what sea angling is becoming. Picking up on what you've said, that many non-anglers simply didn't realise there were sharks in Scottish waters, when you held the event in Loose Bay, which as with the Loch Summit event I attended, you didn't only tag tow. Other shark species and even rays were also tagged. But a lot of good, valuable information can also be anecdotal. The prime example in this particular context is the recent bumper appearance of smooth hounds in southern Scottish waters. What weight, then, can be put onto anecdotal evidence when talking to data-hungry politicians and scientists? And what is the anecdotal stuff actually telling you north of the border? We decided on the shark attack, although it was initially set up for the taupe, we thought at the time, while the anglers are there, and we, we see these special events being an ongoing annual event. So we, we're actually tagging mature thornbacks, bullhus, smoothhound, spurdog and a taupe. And we're also gathering numbers caught on lesser spotted dogs. And this is to be used as a benchmark. We, we will be able to show in five years time, for example, whether stocks have increased, whether stocks have decreased. Some of the things that uh, have been shown by the shark attack is, is not what was caught, but what wasn't caught. When I started fishing in Loose Bay, 50 thornbacks in a tide was not unheard of. We don't see 50 in a year now. In fact, the actual shark attack, there was only six mature fish caught the whole of the Solway by 200 anglers in three days fishing. So, you know, it also sets, can send the alarm buttons going on what isn't being caught. This year, we've had more spur dog than we've seen in the previous 15 years put together, uh, to an extent that uh, one of the boats had 40 spur dog, averaging about 16 pound. This is an area where two years ago we didn't see any spur dog. Now, I'm not suggesting this is a recovery on the spur dog. What's actually happened is, 10 years ago, spur dog were been targeted at a rate of 60,000 tons a year, and this has been dropped through through the work of ourselves and other shark conservation groups, putting pressure on the Scottish Government, and then in turn in Europe, to drop the allowable catch, which it becomes known as a TAC, which is a total allowable catch. Four years ago it dropped to under a thousand tonnes, then it halved, then it halved the following year, and this year it was placed at 52 tonnes. Now that 52 tonnes, once that, that allowance was, was gone, then there was a zero TAC placed upon the species. The commercials are not allowed to land them again until the start of the new, uh, after the new talks in December, the Common Fisheries Policy Talks. So the spur dog, we're not calling this recovery, but the fish we're getting are fish that were probably offshore and would have been caught in the, the, the set lines, the long lines. So the fish are actually been allowed to carry out the migratory route, as opposed to being in intercepted on the way on the migratory route. So that certainly dwells good for the future. If these mature females continue to flourish and, and give birth to live young, then the, the future for the spur dog is good. As a conservation group, we're not saying the commercials do, shall not have any spur dog. All we ask is that things have been fish sustainable. So if there's a, an allowance that the, the commercials can take, it doesn't have a significant effect on the stocks. So there may be a time the spur dog shells recover and the fishing, the commercial fishing targets could actually go up. So we're looking at the long term. And you mentioned earlier the smooth hound. The, the smooth hound, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. Because there's more smooth hound being caught, more people are fishing for them. Because more people fish for them, the word gets out, so more get caught as more people come into the air to fish for them. So we're not quite sure when the smooth hound explosion happened, but certainly last June, one boat had over a 100 in two days. It's phenomenal smooth hound fishing. It may just be that they've been there for quite some time and no one's been fishing crab because they are very, very selective smooth hound in what they will eat. You could have 50 mackerel baits down and one crab bait and I would select the one crab bait. So people are now coming armed with lots of peeler crab to fish for them. So 
It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years. There's certainly been a northern migration on some species. The area seeing like the southwest Scotland seen more bass than it used to see. And I believe I've heard of smooth hound being declined now. So it'll be interesting to see how far north they end up. Do you then see yourselves as a conservation group rather than a preservation group? And if so, what, from Sir Sacken's perspective, are the key differences there in terms of definition? There seems to be little point in preserving something to have on the bottom that no one sees. One of the problems with, with all conservation, particularly to do with the sea, is it's all out of sight, out of mind. So as a conservation group, we want to regenerate the fish stocks to get them back to where they were, to allow the, the benthic communities to, to recover on the bottom. That's what we're about, fish for the future. We're trying to develop things so that my great-great-grandchildren will have the same opportunities I had. There's little point in preserving something for preserving sake. There's an argument we've got, uh, or say an argument, an area we, we have to address is the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Basically, this is declares it illegal to deliberately damage or injure a fish on the biodiversity list. And one could argue sticking a hook inside uh, a shark is actually deliberately injuring it. But without the data, without the knowledge, then the species would probably just end up all being eradicated anyway. So, at the worst scenario when it comes to the likes of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, the absolute worst scenario is that anglers will have to be part of an approved tagging scheme before they're allowed to fish for these sharks. But we are actually arguing for the right for anglers to fish for them because we believe there's such a, a low mortality rate. We're not aware of, of any people who would target the taupe or the common skate or the poor beagle for eating purposes, or there may be one or two tech spur dog. Yeah, so the word preserve, I mean, that, that kind of makes me think about putting something in a jar and keeping it in posterity forever. To conserve may be looked at as to keeping present numbers, but we wish to regenerate. We want to see the numbers restored back to the original glory because the sea needs apex predators. They have a role to play in, in, in the, the healthy ecosystem. So far, the main thrust of what you've been talking about on behalf of Sasakan has, understandably, had a Scottish bias. But I know for a fact that you've also had successes outside of the political boundaries of Scotland, some of which, as was mentioned earlier, have even gone Europe-wide. Give us a little more detail then on the legislative successes that sea anglers can thank Sussacken for. Tope are now protected in England and Wales. Sadly, we haven't got them protected in Scotland yet because they, they don't feel as a problem as there isn't a targeted, it is not a targeted fishery. But we've actually seen tope stocks drop by as much as a half over the last few years. And whether this is due to the, the northern mackerel migrations, we're not quite sure. But uh, we hope to be doing work on the tope. But some of the work in, in Europe it involved the common skate, which is now fully protected. The angel shark is now fully protected. There's a zero attack on, on poor beagle. It hasn't reached full protection status yet, but there's, there's, the organisations are still trying to get the poor beagle fully protected because that is another critically endangered species. The spur dog we've mentioned earlier, where the, there's now a zero attack on them. So five, six years ago, when I started on this conservation front, there actually wasn't any protection on any shark except the Baskin shark. And now five sharks are protected and there's others on the way. Might tackling the lack of protection for taupe in Scottish waters not be better achieved through going for another Europe-wide ban rather than continuing with the local approach? Absolutely. Uh, we, we, but we do see the, the Scottish Parliament's backing of our calls for the taupe as crucial because we'd hardly go to Europe and ask for European protection if they're not going to protect them in Scotland. So part of the strategy actually will be to get the tope protected. That was the, the sea angling strategy that I mentioned earlier. So we're hoping to get the tope protected, say Scotland first, then take the battle to Europe. Because it's actually the fish that are caught, the main majority of the fish that are killed are actually by in the Azores, the baby scale, etc., by commercials as a bycatch. They're not actually targeting the taupe, but they catch them as a bycatch. And it does seem anecdotal again at this moment in time, suggests that the stocks are, are depleting around Britain, certainly Ireland, Jersey, Guernsey, Channel Islands. So something needs to be done. One piece of research I've been looking at recently is that of Irish scientist Ed Farrell, who incidentally is lined up for a podcast here just as soon as he can get a break away from his survey work. For work done on his PhD thesis at Dublin University, 
Ed looked at speciation within smooth hounds at our latitude using DNA markers and has demonstrated that what we as anglers and the National Record Fish Committee people call starry and common smooth hounds are actually one and the same, the spots being little more than within species variation. Ed has also developed a technique of differentiation between the flesh of smooth hounds and taupe. The important implication here being that when similar fish are skinned and made ready for the market, if one is protected and the other isn't, it is still possible to demonstrate that difference. In light of this, might it not be a good idea to extend this work to other cartilaginous species? Yes, I, I know Ed Farrell quite well and uh, I've actually discussed his, his paper with him. His thoughts are that there's only one species of smooth hound in, in UK waters and many of the fish that were thought to be common smooth hounds because there's no stars in them, in fact turned out to be starry. So it does look like there is just the one uh, across the UK. Regarding the other ma matter you mentioned about the uh, at marketplace, what has been landed, we have had a major success in, in two years ago because now across Europe, all fish stocks must be labelled and sent to the market under a full name. For example, Poor Beagle, Taupe, Smooth Hound, the Blues, the Threshers were all taken to the market simply as sharks. And the rays, for example, the Thornback, the Spotted Ray, the Cuckoo Ray, even the Common Skate, were all sent to the market as rays and skate. So now we have species identification which will allow us better understand which species are doing well, which species have been targeted, and which species have been left alone. So that, that was another success we had through, through Europe. That still wouldn't stop people sneaking protected species through. So would these be local names such as the term painted ray as used in some parts of the country, for what is the small eyed ray in other parts, or to prevent any ambiguity, the scientific name which is the same the whole world over? They will actually be called under the, the local names, so that there could be a bit of amb ambiguity there. But they have standardised things. For example, the lesser spotted dogfish is now known as a cat shark because it's been standardised across Europe and the world. Simply, they the renamed the, the common skate a few years ago to standardise it. Maybe so, but do you actually think that people over here are going to switch from the lesser spotted dogfish to the cat shark? I don't think so. Anyway, moving on, what do you see as the future for Sasakan? The future for the Sasakin is obviously uh, growth in terms of number of members. One of the things we're very keen to do is to, to branch out to reach all sea anglers, not just those particularly involved in the sharks or just, just those involved with conservation. We want to meet the guy who takes his son on the, onto the pier on a Saturday morning to do a couple of hours macro bashing. So that's, that's one of our aims over the next year or two. And we want to raise a lot more money because the more that uh, we do, the more we find out, the more we find we don't know, and the more research needs doing. We've recently got a, a funding package worth £110,000 from the government to work on how to assess fish stocks without actually causing any damage to the environment or the stocks themselves. We approach the government scientists because we, we want to be able to go into an area measure the stocks to be able to use as a benchmark for future successes or failures. For example, if we get Loose Bay turned into a, um, an angling uh, regeneration centre or an MPA, then we want to know A, how many fish are there now, and B, how many is in five years, how many is in ten years, so uh, it, we can demonstrate the successes or the failures, but we need that benchmark. So this £110,000 isn't to count the stocks in Loose Bay, it's to work on methods where we can assess the stocks. Once the, this, this particular project comes to an end, we'll be looking for a stage two package. And this will mean getting a lot more money, sourcing funding from various bodies to actually count some of the stocks in the area. And also to prepare papers on how important some species like Pollock or Rass or Conga, how important they are to, to, to sea anglers at the moment have no particular commercial value. But that may change because people tend to fish down the food chain. A product that wasn't considered a commercial target may well be in a year or two's time. So we need to, we need to do more data gathering, more research, more work with the scientists. That's, we believe, the way forward, together with the government, with the government scientists, to working on management plans to develop the inshore fisheries. And we would like to see angling centres in many areas. We'd like to see one in the Clyde. We'd like to see one in the Firth of Forth. 
So there's no reason why there could be a half a dozen, a dozen, or even more angling centres right across Scotland, and to turn Scotland back into a European destination for sea anglers. There's a huge exodus of anglers going to Norway to find fish that used to be here. You know, perhaps 10, 20 years down the line, if things work out, these fish might return here. But unless we try these, try methods to get them back here, then we fear it'll be too late. And given that things continue to go well, how will you know when you've achieved your aims? And what are the benchmarks here? It's sometimes stated by some sea anglers that, that none of the fishing organisations have ever actually achieved anything yet. We disagree because a lot of the protection placed on sharks is a result of, of some of our works. But I really believe will have made a difference when we've got an angling centre in place, perhaps just one as a trial, and the fish stocks start to increase within that area, as, as destructive forms of commercial fishing is barred. Until such times, then it's hard to actually put a, a time and a place and saying, yes, we've achieved success. But it's going to be an ongoing thing. It, it, it isn't just a one-off area. It's all the inshore stocks. We need to return to the former glories. Everything, really. We're, we're, we're more concerned with the fish inside the first three miles. A three-mile limit would be wonderful for Scotland. We're not going to achieve that overnight. We're not even going to try and achieve that overnight. But if we keep working away at angling centres and, and stocks flourish within these places, then we can say we've, we've succeeded. One related topic I'd like to bring in at this point, and I know you don't like it, but a lot of other anglers still do, is the actual weighing of fish, be it for a personal best, a specimen award, or more contentiously, a record claim. In some cases, mainly on account of the physical size, but also in the case of cartilaginous species, because despite their often mature appearance, they are quite delicate. All fish species should have weight estimation graphs produced specifically for them, so that, as in the case of the common skate, length and girth dimensions can be converted into representative industry standard weights, so that not only do fish no longer need to be subjected to the ordeal of weighing, but we can also get around the unreliability problem of weighing fish at sea in a bouncing boat for specimen or record fish status. Is this perhaps something that Sasakan could become involved in? I would certainly like to see it. We are in the, the process of de developing a data wheel, and uh, I can't talk too much about it at the moment because the idea might get pinched, but we, we would like to see a means in which an angler can just measure the length of a fish and from that have an accepted weight. People have been happy with that sort of formula for, for years on a common skate. With a common skate, you take the length, you take the girth, and you read it off a chart. There's one out for tote, which unfortunately is a little inaccurate at the moment, but we're, we're working on that to try and increase the accuracy of it. And we've got tables on, on the website where you can, you can put in the length of a cod, and it will give you a figure. We would actually like to see this across all, across the board and all, all fish. And we're actually recommending now on the tagging programs, because we're, we are so comfortable, we can guesstimate the, the weight from the length that we're actually asking people not to weigh the fish now on the, the tagging programme, and just to take the length. We've one or two people who we, we asked to do this specialist work in the taking the measurements, but we want to see the fish return to the water as quickly as possible. So that's from a catch and release point of view, but also ev even fish that are, are taken, rather than having to weigh them, then take the length, and we can give you the girth. That's the way forwards. But weight is only one approach to expressing size. Because we've become conditioned always to talking in terms of weight, it's become ingrained in our thinking. Yet it isn't the only approach to expressing physical size. And in the current climate, where fish like common skate and talk can't legally be brought ashore for weighing to comply with the prescribed record fish committee rules which require fish to be weighed on firm ground, these species might just as well be removed from the record list. What I personally would like to see is anglers taking the length and multiplying it by the girth to generate a point score. The fatter or longer the fish, the more points it scores in the same way as it would had it been weighed. Even if they ran this alongside the conventional weight records, with all the same witnessing safeguards and photographic requirements, it would at least be a start, the beauty being that it can be done easily in a pitching boat. Providing they can be accepted, as uniform, and all people adhere to it, it doesn't really matter how you do it. I can't give the second policy, I think you know perfectly well my own opinion when it comes to records and things, in that they will now never be beaten. 
For example, it's illegal to kill a taupe in England and Wales. It's illegal to kill a common skate in Scotland. So these records will never be beaten as they stand as wade fish. And yes, perhaps it's time to look at some alternatives, length, girth, etc. But, but even so, for the likes of the tagging program, the taking the girth means you have to lift the fish out of the water. If you're just taking a length measurement, you can actually release it aside the water. It's a matter of holding the rule up against it in the water. The Welsh Federation of Sea Anglers already recognise record fish that have not actually been weighed. The current records for Torp, Spurdog and Smoothhound caught aboard Gethin Owen's boat My Way were all submitted in this way. It's now down to the other less enlightened committees to follow the Welsh lead. Yes, that's that's one way forward. Um, the second doesn't particularly believe in record lists. The, the only list we have is the what we call the GFAC, which is uh, something I, I forgot to mention earlier, and that's to give fish a chance. We've produced a chart which gives the angler an idea of the recommended or the second recommended weight for returning the fish, because the minimum landing size is very, very small, and none of the fish have actually had a chance to breed. We believe to have sustainable fishing, at least let fish breed once. So the GFAC list, for some of them are very, very high. For example, a coley is 60 centimetres. But that shows just how big, how old the fish has to be before it starts to breed. As was said earlier, Sasakan, by its very name, is a Scottish organisation, and understandably, much of what it does is homed in on Scottish waters. That said, it both can and is having a wider impact, sometimes reaching right out into Europe. So with a success rate such as that, what advice would you offer to willing volunteers wanting to achieve the same in other countries, particularly England, with those who would want to take up this particular baton, if they'll forgive me for saying so, currently look like something of a disunited rabble by comparison. Lots of posturing and nice jobs for the boys, but that's about it. So as an outsider, in spirit if not by birth, what advice would you offer to those who would like to emulate what Sasakin has achieved? I personally think in England they need to do more on the practical side to get some practical projects going on to actually let people like English nature see that anglers care and anglers are prepared to do something about conservation. Angling is perceived wrongly, sea angling in particular, where all it's about is going out, bouncing some feathers up and down and taking a load of fish home. Well, that isn't just sea angling, that is a small part of sea angling. Some people like to do that. But it, it's the scientists, it's people at WWF, these are the people you've got to get on board. It's the Marine Conservation Society. They've all got to see that anglers are actually doing something to encourage conservation. It's no good just going to DEFRA and just sitting in meeting after meeting after meeting, going round and round in circles, getting promises out of fisheries ministers who change every few years anyway, and, and getting nowhere. And that, that's the problem. It's perceived in England that they haven't achieved anything, the angling organisations, because nothing concrete has ever, ever actually happened. But by getting involved in the practical side and the scientists realising that angling is an asset. I recently saw a fabulous paper written in from Northern Ireland which looked at commercial and angling catches from competitions going back years and used anglers' anecdotal evidence because they'd realised that anglers contain a huge source of knowledge, and that knowledge isn't been tapped. And this is the way to get through to the scientists, to let them know that we do carry the, a lot of knowledge, that we're the people on, the, on the, the shop floor, so to speak, and we perhaps know a lot more than some of the commercial fishermen who, who perhaps on a mixed fishery, because a lot, a lot of charter skippers, for example, specialise in a certain type of species and know a lot about the movements, a lot about the growth rates and things, by just just by experiencing and studying them. One final point I'd like to make is that a lot of the successes Sasakin has enjoyed have been helped along by the support from English anglers crossing the border wanting to contribute. So the will to conserve is there in England. What we seem to lack is good leadership to unite us and properly take the fight forward. My thanks then to Ian Burrett for taking the time out to talk this subject through with me particularly as we are literally just in from a long, bitterly cold day skate fishing out in the Sound of Jura, and in need of food, a couple of beers and some sleep. Perhaps then, we may try to tempt you back south of the border to help sort out our angling politics problems too. More details regarding Sasakin can be had by visiting their website at www.ssacn.org. <laughs>